Hello and welcome. You are watching the daily news simplified of 13th of February. Today we have taken up different articles and the first prelim centric article is on Swati. Don't worry, Swati is not a person, rather it is a portal which is developed by a government organization to promote and encourage women to join science, engineering and medicine field. Now this initiative is important because from time to time government wants to educate and empower women. For example, a question appeared in prelims on PM Vidyanjali Yojana. Hence, we'll discuss on similar lines what is this Swati portal. Then, we'll move on to the second article which is Governor of Tamil Nadu's refusal to address its state assembly. Now again, constitutional functionaries such as governor, they are a core part of polity syllabus and you can expect questions from time to time on such topics. Hence, we'll discuss what are governor's power in order to whether addressing state legislature or not. Then we'll move to Rabi crops because production of Rabi crops is under question as the Northern Plains, which is a significant producer of Rabi crops, it is witnessing dry and warm days. So, and because of that, Rabi crops productivity will be affected. Also, Rabi crops and Kharif crops, they are a very basic part of agriculture syllabus. And also a question appeared on what are Kharif crops. Hence, we will discuss what following crops come under these Rabi crops. Then we'll move on to Sundarbans. Because India and Bangladesh, they have joined hands for tiger conservation in this particular protected area. Also, UPSC from time to time ask questions on various protected areas that are in news. Hence, in this regard, discussing this article on Sundarbans become important. Then we'll move on to main centric discussion, which is on human animal conflict. Now, conservation of environment and biodiversity, it is directly mentioned in GS paper 3 syllabus. So, when a particular topic such as human and animal conflict that directly deals with a syllabus that is there in the GS paper 3. Hence, it is important from exam's point of view. And with increasing urbanization and industrialization, you can see that the instances of human and animal conflict is increasing day by day. After that, we'll try to summarize important op-eds and text and context news articles of the day. Because these articles, they form a significant part of daily newspaper reading, where a candidate, they spend major chunk of their time reading these important obits. So, we'll try to summarize and give you the important gist of these articles, which will enable you to save your precious time. Hence, in the first summary, we will be dealing with methodology that are used to estimate employment. And why are we dealing with this topic? It is because in GS paper 3, in the year of 2023, a question directly appeared on this particular topic. Again, will be dealing measures which were taken by the government for skill development in India. Again, this is an important topic because skill development enhances employment of a person. So, this deals directly with the macroeconomic concept of increasing employment rates in India. Agreed. So, that's why we'll deal with skill development. Then we'll take a look at global alliance to bridge gender equity gap. Again, this deals with the core part of syllabus that is GS1, which deals with role of women. So, this news article becomes important in context of UPSC exam. And we'll, then we'll end with payment banks, why there is a need for new business model. And this is a news because of restrictions on the payment bank that is Paytm. Also, this deals with regulatory functions of RBI. Hence, it is important from both prelims and main centric discussion. Correct. So, let us move to the first article of the day, which appeared on op ed section of the Indian Express newspaper. Now, this article highlights that government recently launched what was known as a Swati portal, which is a short form for Science for Women, a technology and innovation portal. Now, what this portal tries to do? First of all, let us find out who developed this portal. It was developed by National Institute of Plant Genome Research, which is located in New Delhi. 
and it is an initiative of inter academic panel on women in science technology engineering mathematics and medicine now the objective of establishing this portal is to represent indian women and girls who have significant achievements in the field of stem thereby this portal will provide a comprehensive database of achievement of women especially women who have won padma awards and other important science awards such as shanti swarup bhatnagar award tri shakti science samman etc also it will cover details about these women across their career stages it will also carry their research works in form of research papers so it will be a complete database of women and their achievements now what is the significance of establishing such portal first of all it will try to inspire and encourage women because women when they see other women achieving some very good professional capabilities then they'll themselves be inspired to take up these kind of works also it will bring up each and every research paper in the public domain so it will promote research activities also so when these research works are there in public development and women they'll be inspired so it will help government formulate policies in the field of stem so this tries to inspire and encourage women to join science field and promote scientific research in the community and the country so let us take up this swati portal again which we have curated a practice question because the important declarations and portals they have been asked in upsc from time to time for example i earlier highlighted that a previous year question appeared on pm vidyanjali yojana which is again an initiative to promote women so we'll discuss this question the first statement it states that it is developed by council of scientific and industrial research which is an incorrect statement because it was developed by national institute of plant genome research the second statement that swati portal it is an initiative of inter academic panel on women in science technology engineering and management which again is a correct statement because i have highlighted this here the third statement the portal will serve in policy making to address the challenges of gender gap again there is a significant gender gap even in fields such as stem so when the achievements of women it is put in public domain women themselves will want to participate in the field right so the government will be encouraged to formulate policy in this regard which will help government to bridge the gender gap thereby this third statement is correct therefore option b is the correct answer to this model question now moving to the next article of the day which appeared in both these the hindu and indian express newspaper now this news article it highlights that the uh, tamil nadu governor that is mr ravi he has refused to address the customary uh, speech in the state legislature due to some political issue now that political issue is not important what is important is the governor's power whether he can deliver or refuse to deliver the speech right let us discuss this now the constitution of india it provides obligation on constitutional functionaries that is president of india and governor of the state to address the first session of a state legislature or the parliament now this is held under two different articles first of all article 87 as you can see it warrants a special address by the president in the first session after e general election and at the commencement of first session of each year in parliament and on similar lines there is a special address by the governor at the first session after e general election to the legislative assembly and also the first session of each year so you can see under article 87 and article 76 of the constitution the governor and the president they are required to present a customary address to the legislatures 
Now, despite this provision, the governor of Tamil Nadu has refused to accept it. So, let us take a look what is the judicial opinion on the subject. Now, there are two important cases. The first is Yogendra Singh Handa was a state of Rajasthan case. And in this case, the High Court of Rajasthan, it said that even if the governor, he addresses a part of the speech, of the complete speech, even then he will be deemed to have given a, he would be deemed to have completed this constitutional requirement. So, according to this, either he addresses it partially or fully, even then the governor would have been completed this responsibility. Now, in Abdul Ghaffur Habibullah case, here, Calcutta High Court said that it is a constitutional duty of a functionary such as governor to address the house. So, if he declines to address the house, then it will be counted as a refusal to do his constitutional duty. So, let us discuss what is the model question and we have curated this question because you can see discretionary power of the governor of a state has been asked by UPSC before and this particular question I think appeared in 2016 or 2014. I am not sure you can check in the notes that I have given below. The answer to this question was option B. So, you can see powers of constitutional functionary that is governor are important from exam's point of view. So, let us consider this model question. Uh, the first statement it states that article 176 of the constitution provides for customary state by governor in the state assembly. Now, you can see from this particular screenshot, it was article 176 that provides for special address by the governor. Hence, first statement here is a correct statement. The second statement, it says that the governor has a discretionary power in reading out the text of address and is officially held liable for the text of the address. Now, this statement is an incorrect because when governor reads out the text of the constitution, it is not his view, rather the government's view. So, in that regard, governor, he is not officially liable for any acts that he takes while he is in office. Therefore, the second statement here is incorrect. So, the correct answer to this model question is option A. Then we will proceed to the next article, which appeared in the business line, page 7. Now, you can see that this article highlights that there has been a doubts over yield of rabi crops. And this is because there has there is a projection that there will be a dry and warm days in the northern India in coming days. So, this particular news article is important from agricultural topic because questions regarding important crops which are grown in Kharif season have been asked by UPSC before, especially in the year 2013. So, you can see we have curated a model question on similar lines on crops which are grown in Rabi season. But before solving this model question, let us take a look what are these crops which are grown in different seasons in India. Now, the first crop that is covered in the news, it is Rabi crops and these are grown in winter months. Therefore, these crops, they require less water to grow and important Rabi crops in India are wheat, barley, pulses, grams and some more. Also important oil seeds such as mustard, sunflower and rape seed, they are also grown in Rabi months. So, you can see uh, mustard which is widely consumed in India and rape seed which is again a variety of mustard they are grown in Rabi season and also wheat which is a staple crop in most of the parts of India it is also grown in Rabi season. Now moving on to Kharif season this word Kharif it comes from an Arabic term thereby this term means autumn. So naturally you can understand that these Kharif crops they are grown in autumn season now, these crops, they require large amount of water, thereby they can only be grown in monsoon season. Now, these uh, crops, they require either rain-fed areas which have high rainfall 
or areas which has irrigation support. Thereby, these are grown in mostly hot and humid climates. Now, the major crops such as maize, cotton, rice, which again is a staple crop in East and Southern India, it is grown in Kharif season. Also, important millet such as jowar, which is again a Kharif crop, as well as groundnut, which is an important oil seed. Because in states such as Gujarat, groundnut it is used to pro produce groundnut oil, which is consumed widely in states such as Gujarat. So, let us discuss the model question now. Which of the following crops are grown in Rabi season? Here, gram and mustard are crops that are grown in Rabi season, whereas maize and cotton, they are grown in Sorry, uh, maize and cotton, they are grown in Kharif season. Thereby, option B is the correct answer because only 1 and 4 is grown in Rabi season. Whereas you can see, option to this PYQ was option C. Now, moving on to the fourth article of the day, which highlights that India and Bangladesh, they have joined hands together to conserve tigers in Sundarban. Now, this Sundarban, it is world's largest mangrove forest, which you can see is located in both India and Bangladesh. Now, the Sundarban National Park, it is drained by rivers such as Brahmaputra, Malda, as well as Harigat. Now, this particular uh, initiative, it is taken under the aegis of Integrated Tiger Habitat Conservation Program. Now, the details of this program I have provided in the PDF notes, which you can see later on after the session ends. What we'll discuss is the nature of this particular protected area. Now, Sundarbans, it is important from UPSC syllabus because it is world's largest contiguous mangrove forest in the world and it has a wide range of fauna which you can understand because mangrove forest is a densely populated forest now it is this sundarbans they are of universal importance because it contains many globally endangered species such as royal bengal tiger ganga and irrawaddy river dolphins estuarine crocodiles and also a critically endangered species which is known as baktagur Baska. Now, it is important to note that Sundarbans, they are the only mangrove habitat in the world which has Panthera tigris subspecies. So, this is an important topic which you must remember. Also, this particular protected area, it was designated as World Heritage Site by UNESCO back in 1987. And also recent development around this protected area is that it was designated as a Ramsar site in 2019. So, let us solve the model question which we have curated on Sundarbans. Because questions on important uh, forests such as mangrove grasslands, they have been a subject of UPSC from time to time. Correct. So, let us discuss this model question. The first statement is, that it is largest contiguous mangrove forest in the world. Now, when a candidate, usually in an exam atmosphere, he or she witnesses an absolute statement which says it's largest or only, they have a natural tendency to mark that question incorrect. But it is important to realize that always this is not a correct assumption because UPSC from time to time can trick you into believing an absolute statement to be incorrect. Which again, the first statement here is a correct statement as I have highlighted. It is the largest contiguous mangrove forest in the world. Moving on to the second statement. This state that it is the only mangrove habitat in the world for Panthera tigris species. Which again is a correct statement. Moving on to the third. Both Irrawaddy river dolphin and Gangetic river dolphins can be found in this region. 
which again is a correct statement because this region contains tiger, Irrawaddy river dolphin, Gangetic river dolphins, Asherin crocodiles, as well as Batagur baksa. Hence, the correct answer to this question is option C. Whereas, option C was also the correct answer to this model question which appeared in 2013. Now, let us move to the first mains related article of the day which appeared in the Indian Express Explained section. Now, this article, it reports that a man, he was trampled to death by an elephant in Vayanad, which is in Kerala. Now, this is just an example that human and wildlife conflict is increasing day by day. And there are many reasons to that, which we'll discuss in today's discussion. Now, this topic is important because UPSC GS Paper 3 syllabus, it highlights environment and biodiversity conservation. So, when a topic is mentioned directly in the UPSC syllabus, its importance grows manifold. Also, because of increasing news, which you will hear day by day, there are reports that human and wildlife conflict are on an increase. You can see that there are various reasons across the board, which can result into human and wildlife conflict. Now, this photo on the right, it is a direct example of conflict between animals, especially wild animals and humans. Because in this photo, you can see a leopard who has strayed into a densely populated human areas and locals naturally, they are afraid of that animal. So, either it will result into death of humans or harm to animals, which in both cases are not desirable. So, let us first understand and why is this problem so significant? It is because many people have died in the recent past because of the attacks by wild animals. For example, as many as 293 people died because of tiger attacks and as many as 2657 people have died due to elephant attacks. And not just people have died due to wild animal attacks. Also, animals, they have lost their lives because of various human activities. For example, as many more than 100 elephants have lost their lives over a period of few years due to human activities. So, you can understand that not just wild animals, but also humans are in danger of existence because of this human and animal conflict. So, in this next slide, let us understand what are the primary reasons which cause human and wildlife conflict. First of all, you can see that due to increased urbanization, we require more and more land to settle people in urban areas. So, for example, a particular year, a particular area which was a forest 20 years back, it is now developed into a proper urban areas filled with residential complexes, business complexes and IT parks, roads, airports, railways, what not. So, you can understand that urbanization requires forest and agricultural land to be converted into urban land. So, naturally, you have to uh, convert these lands by felling down of trees, which reduces the amount of land which is required by animals to sustainably exist. So, when there is a loss of agricultural and forest land due to urbanization, these animals they have lesser areas to coexist. And this creates increased animal and human conflict. Again, increasing population, especially in urban areas, it has warrant more agricultural commodities. So, naturally you have to grow crops on more areas which requires conversion of forest areas into agricultural land use areas. Again, this conversion will reduce the amount of forest that exists for animals, which again is makes it vulnerable for human and wildlife conflict. Because for example, a farmer he is cultivating a land on a recently converted agricultural land, he or she may be witness to tiger or elephant attacks. 
because tiger and elephants they are used to grazing over those lands right so this because of urbanization and agricultural land use we see increasingly human and wildlife conflicts again increasing urbanization requires development in infrastructure especially construction of roads railways airports etc and these also require conversion of lands from forest into infrastructure lands for example if you are uh, constructing a new national highway or expressway this also requires those expressways which are passing through forest so again construction of modern infrastructure to demand the needs of increasing po population it also increases the vulnerability or possibility of human and wildlife conflict correct also we witness that due to increased natural disaster particularly due to rising climate change for example in kaziranga when uh, annually flood takes place and due to these floods animals which are existing or living in low lying areas they move to upper or high lying areas so this again creates a chance that these animals may come into conflict into that native population right so this increasing natural disasters it creates chance for for landslides and floods which again forces these animals to move into densely populated areas for their immediate protection also i have highlighted that increasing urbanization and population it requires more animals for meat and milk purposes so naturally to sustain these animals you need lands for them to graze over again where will these animals graze that is in densely populated forest areas now where when for example they are grazing in these densely populated forest areas they can again become prey to wild animals such as lion and tiger so again activities such as livestock grazing it again creates opportunities for increasing human and wildlife conflict now also not all animals in india they live in protected areas such as wildlife sanctuary and natural parks many of the animals they also live outside these areas so whenever there is a human population near or very close vicinity to wildlife sanctuary and national parks they also have a chance of increasingly conflict with humans and wildlife for example in mumbai in between the city there is a national park called sanjay gandhi national park so in case a animal it can escape that national park he or she, that animal can come into conflict with humans right so all these six factors they combine into increasing conflict between humans and wildlife so what should be the step by the government and local communities to reduce these conflicts let us find out in the next slide now first of all there is a immediate requirement to identify the source of conflict and let me tell you why are we dealing with this way forward because national board of wildlife its standing committee gave suggestions regarding human wildlife conflict also government recently came up with national wildlife action plan for year 2017 to 2031 and both of these measures they have suggested some kinds of actions that should be taken by state forest department local communities to minimize these animal and wildlife conflict now let us first understand what were their recommendations the first recommendation was that there is a dire need to identify the sources of conflict and naturally this sources of conflict is that human population are increasing so when human population is increasing they want more and more land which again is utilized by removal of forest now if for example a forest has a wild animal such as leopard or tiger then that wild animal will 
naturally attack human population right so there is a first need to identify the key sources of conflict by identifying key source of conflict and what kind of wild animals live in that area we can identify these wild animals and also their behavior patterns and based on these behavior patterns the local community centric measures can be undertaken for example a community lives in vicinity of a tiger or a leopard population which is a, a, a dangerous animal then that community can be trained to take up rapid measures because these communities they are the immediate they bore the immediate brunt of animal attacks so when these communities they witness an animal attack first what should they do is that they should inform the state forest department now naturally the state forest department will take some time to undertake measures but by the time they undertake measures we should enable the local community to have some kind of self defense now when the local community will be able to undertake self defense in their own cause then it will also strengthen the local community to deal with these animal attacks also what we need is an improved forest governance first of all by increasing the capacity of state forest department to tackle these human and wildlife conflicts for example they should have a rapid action force because these rapid action force will be the first responders to any human and wildlife conflict information also the state forest department should undertake efforts to monitor these populations because in these wildlife populations when they attack humans the state forest department can rapidly deploy their forces to tackle these instances of human and wildlife conflict correct but also there is a need to explore alternative ways to deal with this human wildlife conflict because naturally when you understand human wildlife conflict, uh, conflict you understand the need to segregate wildlife from human population correct but you cannot just create a wall or fencing between humans and wildlife so you need to explore alternative ways for example you need to control the population of vermin animals for that you need contraceptive measures also what you can do is create biofencing because this biofencing is not just important ecologically but it but will also enable safe segregation between wildlife and humans correct so identifying first the key sources of conflict identifying what kind of animals live in the area and what are their behavior patterns this will help the community to prepare the animal attacks in a better way now when community themselves they can inform the state forest department and immediately deal with the human wildlife conflict instances this will improve their resilience and also improved forest governance such as capacity building of state forest department will enable the state forest department to deal with these instances of conflicts but also we need to control or minimize these conflicts for that we need to take alternative and unconventional ways by creating biofences or by contracepting the vermin animals we can regulate their population and we can also regulate the movement of these wild animals so that's what was today's main related discussion on animal and human wildlife conflict and with this we move to summary articles of the day the first of which appeared in text and context section of the hindu newspaper now this article it is important for various purposes because this whole article it is just a data enriched article but you need to segregate what is important in this article from exams perspective for example if you look at these tables closely there is this data related to unemployment rate that is common weekly status usual status or usual status and subsidiary status now what are this cws usual status and principal subsidiary status 
these kind of methodologies it is employed by nso to estimate unemployment or employment in the country now why this topic is picked up by us today because it is an important part of gs paper 3 syllabus which highlights indian economy and issues relating to mobilization of resources and employment also a question related to methodologies used to calculate or compute unemployment in the country it was asked by upsc in the year 2023 correct so this is an important topic now let us understand what are the methodologies adopted by national statistic organization or nsso to estimate the amount of people employed or unemployed in the country there are usually three methods the first is usual principal status this methodology it requires or it tries to understand what a person was doing in his majority of the time correct so if a person is employed in the majority of a time of a year and the time period for this assumption is one year so if a person is employed for a majority of a time in period of one year then that person will be categorized as employed for example if a person is employed for more than 6 months in a year then that person will be categorized as an employed person under this usual principal status now the second is called usual principal and subsidiary status which is again called as ps plus ss method now this particular method it wants to understand what the person was doing in his non majority time but what is the time period of this non majority time this requires not less than 30 days so the assessment period of this survey is again one year so for example if a person is employed more than 30 days in a year then also he or she will be categorized as an employed person under this usual principal and subsidiary status survey the third survey is called as current weekly status as the name suggest the time period for this assessment is one week and not one year as in other two instances and this determines what a person was doing in the last period of one week and again even if a person is employed for one hour in a week he or she will be categorized as an employed person so these three were the methodologies that is usual principal status usual principal and subsidiary status as well as current weekly status which is used by nsso to estimate the amount of people employed or unemployed in the country correct so let us move to the same article which we'll take up today and also we'll deal with another aspect of this article because as you can see this article the heading of this article highlight that finance minister has claimed that 1.4 crore youth have been trained under skill india mission so the aspect of skilling your workforce it is important from an economic standpoint because skilling your workforce will enable your workforce to undertake better jobs or higher productive jobs because india as a nation it wants to grow leap and bounds so naturally it wants to structurally transform the nature of employment in the country because currently more than 50% of our population in, is engaged in agricultural activities so to make these population more productive you need to move them away to manufacturing and service sectors so naturally for a farmer to undertake manufacturing or service related activity he or she needs to be trained in a different vocations and this is what you call skill training so skill training it is directly related to employment in the country because it mobilizes your resource that is your population in a more economically productive activity and also improving the skill levels of your population it is important to reap the demographic dividend of the country because india's working 
एज पॉपुलेशन विच इंक्लूड्स पॉपुलेशन बिटवीन फिफ्टी टू फिफ्टी नाइन ईयर्स ऑफ एज इट वॉज फिफ्टी परसेंट बैक इन दर ट्वेंटी इलेवन बट दिस पॉपुलेशन इट इज स्टेटेड टू इंक्रीज टू फिफ्टी नाइन परसेंट बाय दर ट्वेंटी फोर्टी वन सो एज यू कैन सी मोर एंड मोर पीपल विल बी अंडर वर्किंग एज एंड दे रिक्वायर टू बी ट्रेंड इन वेरियस एक्टिविटीज फॉर देम टू बी मोर प्रोडक्टिव इकोनॉमी वाइज एंड दिस पर्टिकुलर न्यूज आर्टिकल विच डील्स विद स्किल ट्रेनिंग इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट फ्रॉम जी एस पेपर थ्री सिलेबस नाउ लेट एस अंडरस्टैंड वाई डू वी नीड स्किल ट्रेनिंग इन द फर्स्ट प्लेस बिकॉज ओवरऑल द स्किल लेवल ऑफ द कंट्री इज क्वाइट लो बिकॉज अबाउट थर्टीन परसेंट ऑफ कंट्रीज पॉपुलेशन इज स्किल ट्रेनड now this is very less for example developed nations such as us and uk they have more than 65% of the population who is skilled trained so comparing to that india only has about 1/5 that is 13% of the people who have undertaken some form of skill training but not all these 13% of people have undertaken formal skill training because formal skill training is undertaken by only 2% of the people where is 11% of the people they have undertake some kind of informal skill training so naturally for india to be more economically productive you have to increase this particular statistic and match them to the statistics of developed countries and why do we need or why are, why do we need skill training in the first place it is because government has set targets to increase the skill development levels of its population because under national skill development mission government wants to train as much as 400 million indians and they'll want to they'll want this population to undertake skill development which will enable them to meet market demands of skilling because as you understand the government is undertaking what is known as atman nirbhar bharat initiative which means most of the important commodities such as electronics defense equipments the government wants to manufacture them in india only but to manufacture them you require skilled workforce and this skilled workforce will be provided under national skill development missions which will enable training of as much as 40 crore individuals again this focus is more on providing skill training to youth because under skill impact bond initiative government wants to encourage public and private partnership in skill development and this government wants to focus on youth so you can see under skill impact bond initiative government wants to train 50000 youth among which 40% will be women and because of undertaking skill development of both youth and its entire workforce the government of india it wants to make india the skill capital of the world because when india is the skill capital of the world it will not just provide skill workforce for its domestic industry but will also enable india to export its skilled workforce to other nations such as japan and germany which currently have low levels of or absence of workers so this need of workers in those industrial countries can also be met by indian skilled workforce now in this regard government has taken many initiatives i have attached a slide of this initiative and details of all these initiatives are provided in the pdf which we have attached in the description box so after this session ends you can go and read these initiatives and we'll deal this particular topic in detail at a later date when a particular or specific article on skill development comes in the newspaper and rest assured we'll deal with that article and with this let us move to the next article of the day which you can see appeared in the op-ed section of the hindu newspaper now india recently at the meeting in world economic forum it launched a alliance for global good which is an alliance for gender equity and equality 
and this shows that india government is it is serious in encouraging gender equality so this news article is important from gs paper 1 syllabus which deals with role of women so let us understand what is this global alliance now this alliance for global good and gender equity and equality it is a multi stakeholder initiative because this initiative it was anchored by cii for women and it is supported by ministry of women and child development as well as bill and melinda gates foundation now this initiative it wants to focus on health of women their education skill training bridging their digital divide now also important is that india launched we lead lounge initiative at world economic forum which wanted or which hosted discussions and products of women entrepreneurs especially in the fields of health education and other important initiative and in this regard let us discuss the initiatives taken by government for welfare or achieving equality for women because only last year government brought women reservation in legislatures that is in parliament and state legislature because fixing the amount of seats for women in legislatures that is parliament and state legislature it will promote political equality for women also government has undertaken measures such as formulating a separate budgeting for women and this is known as gender budgeting and in the budget of last year that is 2023 and 24 government of india it provided nearly 27 billion dollars for women and their related schemes so these are the initiatives that have been taken by government to promote equality and equity among women now let us discuss notable achievements in this regard because these four facts you can utilize in your main answer writing first of all let us deal with participation of women in labor force and this has increased in recent times because in 2017 and 18 this figure it was 23.3% but in 2022 and 23 this has increased to 37% so you can see india has seen greater participation of women in workforce also participation of women in educational sector especially higher education and science and technology it has also witnessed increase for example as many as 28% growth was seen in participation of women in higher education whereas share of women in stem sector it is currently 43% so you can see the gap in stem sector has reduced because we can witness the increased participation of women also government wants to undertake socio economic development of women and how it is undertaking them by constituting or forming self help groups among women and as many as 9 crore women are engaged all over the country in as many as 83 lakh self help groups so you can see through these measures government has undertaken development and equality of women and it has also led to significant socio economic achievements now let us move to the last article of the day which appeared in the business line newspaper now this news article it primarily deals that recently paytm was put under several restrictions by the regulator that is reserve bank of india and it is because this particular company that is paytm it refused to comply to various directions by the rbi now these payments bank they were formulated after the uh, recommendation by nachiket poor committee now these payment banks they are known as a type of differential banks because they are separate from normal banks which are known as scheduled commercial banks 
now naturally these differential banks they only provide a niche service that is they want to enable digital payment in the country and for that they can only take deposits up till 2 lakh rupees can they lend to other people that is no they cannot lend further they are subjected to high reserve requirements for as much as 75% of slr and they also need to keep 15% of their assets under risk weighted assets now this particular news article it highlights that the business model of these payments bank they are not very conducive for their existence because as you can see that these payment banks they cannot undertake or they cannot extend loans directly rather they have to collaborate with existing banks and then they can extend loans further these banks as they cannot extend loans then it limits their revenues to generate profit also originally these payment banks they were envisaged as banks that will facilitate digital payments but with introduction of unified payment interface an aadhar enabled payment system every bank account is digitally linked so you can utilize or digitally pay using upi or aps which then bypasses these payment banks so you can see that these payment banks they are not required by every bank account in the country because instead they can utilize upi and aps to undertake digital transactions also these payment banks they cannot charge money for these upi activities so you can see that the business avenues they are limited for these payment banks thereby this article suggest newer models for these payment banks to become economically viable and the first suggestion was that changing these payment banks into neo banks because by making these banks neo banks it will enable the payment banks to extend loans to micro lenders so this will increase their ability to generate profit and also this news article it suggests that the regulation of payment infrastructure and payment banks should be brought outside rbi so this article it suggests that a separate committee needs to be formed which will regulate these payment banks correct so this was all for today's discussion in dns if you have any doubts you can ask me in the comment section down below and i'll try to address your doubts as soon as possible I am waiting for your questions. Now I cannot see any question right now. You can ask me your questions in the comment section down below, and we'll try to address your question at the earliest possible time. Correct. So with this, I wish you a very good night, and we'll see you again tomorrow at six pm.